I'm going to uh, sort of run you through some of the work that um, my lab's been doing and then, and then some of the things that we're interested in uh, for the time being. Uh, this is a uh, nice... Uh, this is a building I work in in nice sunny Brighton. It's down on the south coast of England, about as far away from Scotland as you can get. But we did actually manage to, to beat the Scots. And we, we usually do in football as well as um, uh, whatever. And, <laughs> but the slightly, dis slightly disappointing thing was we were told that um, there would be real disaster if we left the European Union, and it started. And... <laughs> You can see the big disparity in what's going to happen in the future. So, so my lab's really um, interested in, in replication forks along, I think, and now it seems with, with everybody else in the world. And, and we're particularly interested in what happens when replication goes wrong and how cells restart replication. And this is just a, a diagram taken from a review I wrote with Sarah Lambert. Um, <coughs> and I think she drew the diagram, actually. And, um, you know, the replication encounters a lot of problems, but I'm sure you're all aware. Things like DNA-bound proteins, uh, at-risk DNA sequence motifs, uh, collisions with, replica uh, with transcription, maybe chromatin structure and things like that. And <clears throat> many of the ways in which we've addressed this traditionally uh, was to treat cells with DNA damaging agents or agents such as hydroxyurea or phytocholine, which randomly cause stochastic replication problems. And that makes it quite difficult uh, for, you know, to, to really see what's going on at the, uh, at the molecular level. At least it, it, it's put certain limitations on what you can do. And sort of driven by um, the success of things like the HO double-strand brake system developed by Jim Haber, um, we decided to try and set up a site-specific tool to explore replication fork arrest and restart. And um, we chose this method uh, <coughs> based on a, a, a small sequence which is located close to the mating type switching locus in fission yeast. And don't worry, you don't need to know anything about mating type switching in fission yeast. Um, and this had been characterized by Jacob Dalgart. And <coughs> it's a small DNA sequence of about 800 base pairs which binds to a protein called RTF1. It's a mid-domain DNA binding protein. And the sole role of this protein seems to be to coordinate a bunch of factors to arrest the replication forks when they're traveling in one particular direction. And that particular direction in this case is, is in this direction. And it's actually important for mating type switching in fission yeast because it's the way mating type switches in fission yeast starts off by laying down a marker, which is a couple of RNA molecules, uh, <coughs> thought to be a couple of RNA molecules in the DNA. And that requires that the replication fork goes through in a particular direction. So the efficiency of mating type switching is affected if you take this uh, sequence away, but not the mechanism. And we we're not interested in mating type switching, so we wanted to move this sequence to another place in the, in the genome and then ask what happened to the cells if they couldn't replicate a piece of DNA. And we've done a lot of characterization. I'll just run you through uh, a few bits and pieces I think are interesting and important. So <clears throat> from all our characterization, we've come up with a fairly straightforward model on how uh, replication restarts in fission yeast. And what we found is that to, if replication is, is arrested at this barrier, the replication fork is no longer able to just resume replication when the problem goes away. It actually requires homologous recombination to restart the replication fork. So it's different from when you add hydroxyurea or some drug that stops replication and then take that away and then replication resumes and the, and the helicase and all the paraphernalia remain associated with the DNA at the right place doing the right thing. Um, <clears throat> this is a bit like adding those sorts of drugs to your cells without a checkpoint and everything goes wrong and the only way you can restart replication from this is by homologous recombination. And what, what we think happens is you start to generate single-stranded DNA behind the replication fork. We imagine that the replication fork moves backwards and you re the, uh, <coughs> the two parental strands and then <coughs> what happens is you have recombination proteins associated with this piece of single-stranded DNA and it's able to reinvade back in front of the, <coughs> you know, back into the area where, it, oh God, where it was, okay. And <coughs> this, um, uh, inv this invasion generates a, a replication structure like a D-loop and presumably that's able to bypass this, this barrier in a way we don't understand. And, and then you can continue with DNA replication. 
And the important part of this particular model and the surprise to us at the time was that we get no evidence of a double strand break. And I think replication uh, for, you know, they arrest in various different ways, as I showed you earlier, and they, they get restarted in various different ways. And I don't think the cell will make a double strand break unless it has to. So I think this probably represents one way in which cells can restart replication uh, from a, a, a broken or a collapsed replication fork. <coughs> So we've characterized this in some detail, as I said, and this is just an example of a synchronous culture going through S phase. And if you don't have the barrier active, and we can stop the barrier being active by simply not expressing this protein that binds to the DNA sequence, and then this DNA sequence is, is just replicated passively and normally. It's just a normal piece of DNA in that circumstance. And you just get passive replication, which you can see through the replication bubbles here. Um, but if you, have the if you have the barrier active, then the vast majority of the forks actually actually arrest at, a particular, you know, at this particular site, and you see that as a dot on what would be the Y arc. That increases, you <coughs> get some processing, and then it goes away, and replication is completed. And we've been able to time how quickly it takes the cells to undergo this event, and it takes about 15 to 20 minutes. So if you look at, in a normal situation, this piece of DNA and this piece of DNA will be replicated at the same time in a synchronous culture, and that's what you see here. But when the barriers act, it takes about 15 to 20 minutes for this piece of DNA marked U5 to be replicated in comparison to the timing of that piece of DNA marked L3. So <clears throat> one of the first things we, we did when we set this system up is we set up this structure where we actually had a small inverted repeat with a couple of KB spacer in between it. And the idea was that there's no origins in here. Replication would be arrested here and be arrested here. There's a strong origin here, so this is the first this is the first arrest point. And then <clears throat> we were interested to see how the cell coped with that. And as it turned out, we required homologous recombination, etc., etc. et, cetera, et cetera. Um, But one thing we noticed was we generated these chromosomal rearrangements, which resulted in acentric and dicentric chromosomes. And they're at fairly low frequency. They don't uh, affect the overall growth rate of the culture. But obviously, if you take a haploid organism and mash one of its chromosomes up into a dicentric and an acentric, that particular cell is going to be dead. And that was occurring about 1 in, <coughs> one in 50, uh, 1 in 40 times that the cells replicated through the, this region by homologous recombination. And of course, this would be a nice precursor to a breakage fusion bridge cycle if we were working in a, in a human cell. And <clears throat> what we spent a, a bunch of time working out how this, this operated, and it, it turns out that what the cell you know, wants to do is to invade into this DNA sequence here, okay? But we have a second sequence just nearby in an inverted orientation, and what happens is you get this ectopic or non-allelic homologous recombination as the cell doesn't really know the difference between these two pieces of DNA. It can only do homologous recombination based on sequence identity. So about one in 40 times, it essentially makes a mistake, and it invades here, and then it tries to replicate back, and all kinds of gymnastics happen, and what you end up with is, is acentric and dicentric chromosomes. Okay, so... This is our model on how you could, <coughs> you could generate errors uh, during DNA replication. And we went on to show that you could take this repeated, well, this second copy of the sequence and put it on another chromosome and you'd get a low level of translocations. You could put it as a direct repeat and you could delete the bit in the middle. And there was some relationship between the distance of these things were apart and the, and the frequency in which they generated these non-allelic recombination events. But we, we did another experiment, which we didn't do for any particularly good reason, it turned out, which was that instead of using this sequence, this co uh, construct, we simply duplicated the Euro 4 gene to generate a small palindrome. It's actually got a, 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 an interruption of about 16 base pairs, if I remember, or 14 base pairs. And <coughs> we, what we noticed was that these cells actually generated a, a very much higher level of these acentric and dicentric chromosomes. Okay, and that <coughs> the level's so high that the population actually has has trouble overcoming it, and you can see it as a as a kind of slow growth of the population on a spot test. And if you look down the microscope, you can clearly see about one in five cells are generating these chromosome bridges. And we've gone on to show that these are actually the chromosome bridges you'd expect when you try to to to, to um, separate a dicentric chromosome. 
And <clears throat> so we imagined that, that this was basically a very high, a very large increase in the amount of ectopic recombination, and we were interested into why that was, and we had all kinds of fancy uh, hypotheses for why that was. Um, but fortunately, we did a, a control experiment, and the control experiment was, well, we'll just leave everything intact, but we'll just take away that second copy of the sequence, and then we'll, um, we won't be able to do this kind of rearrangement, and therefore all of these uh, acentric and dicentric chromosomes will go away. And when we, <coughs> so we're basically forcing the cell if you like, to do the right event because there isn't a wrong event to do. And actually what we saw was we still had a very large um, percentage of these rearrangements. We, in this case, we're detecting them by southern blot analysis. And that was a big surprise to us. And <coughs> we did a lot of, uh, of additional work. And what we found out was that the, the replication started correctly at the correct site. But the replication fork, as it moved, to, the, you know, the new replication machine, as it moved away from uh, the restart site, was highly prone to making errors. And in our case, what it was doing was, as it tried to replicate through the, the middle of a short inverted repeat sequence, it tended to flip back on itself and do a U-turn and start replicating the DNA in the wrong direction. Uh, Sarah Lambert's group came up with a, a similar set of observations, and what she showed was that, that the same replication fork, when it was restarted and was traveling like this, had, it had a tendency to, to make um, errors at microhomology, uh, so you get this microhomology mediated replication slippage. And so it looks like this, the, you know, the, 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 you know, the primer strand is actually somehow breathing and falling off the DNA and going back on again and has a tendency to go into the wrong place. And so we became very interested in why this replication machine is making so many errors. Because until we'd done these experiments, I'd always imagined that once you'd got past this barrier, done a little bit of gymnastics, then this replication machine was a canonical replication machine and would go ahead and finish replication for you without any additional errors. Um, <clears throat> so the question we, we, we became interested in was, you know, why is homologous recombination restarted replication so error prone? And the first question that we, we, we sort of thought of was, well, you know, is this really semi-conservative replication because we've always imagined that you're resetting a replication fork uh, as quickly as you can in order to do a normal replication event but we could also imagine and it's has recently been shown with uh, break induced replication that in fact having done a D-loop invasion the D-loop just continues to migrate along the DNA and <coughs> that perhaps this is the reason that the replication machine is so error prone. And if you, if you imagine that you have this kind of uh, migrating D-loop replication, then what you're going to see is both of the new strands appear in the same duplex and both of the old strands appear in the same duplex. So this would be uh, conservative replication, whereas the normal replication event, as you know, is semi-conservative replication. So we could address this quite easily. Well, I would say easily, at least logically easily. It was technically quite difficult. Address this um, by... Uh, density substitution, a classic Matheson style type experiment. And so this is the fragment that we analyze. We run our uh, replication forks through in this direction. If the barrier is active, they have to restart, and then this piece of DNA is replicated by homologous recombination. So if there's no barrier activity, we delete the protein that, that causes the barrier activity. Then what we see if we take synchronized cells that are grown in light, light medium, then the light medium, uh, you know, you get DNA which which is obviously normal, it's not heavy because you haven't added any heavy isotopes. We then have, add the heavy isotopes to the medium and let these synchronized cells go through a single S phase. And if you, um, <coughs> you know, don't have any barrier activity, what you expect is all of your DNA becomes heavy light and it runs between the markers of heavy, heavy and light, light DNA just as you expect. Then you can do the same experiment with the barrier active and what we saw was that all the DNA still run in the heavy light region. So this is semi conservative replication. We see absolutely no evidence of any DNA which is um, heavy, heavy, and these are the, this, this dotted line is actually the, the, the plasmid control DNA. And we can flip this experiment around and grow everything in heavy and then flip it to light and we get the same sort of result. So the, <coughs> the answer is that the, the replication machine is at least replicating the DNA in, in a kind of canonical way in terms of giving semi-conservative replication. So <clears throat> this is very unlike the situation in uh, budding yeast where cells are arrested in G2, a double-strand break is made, and then after uh, a failed homologous for combination for second end capture, you get a migrating D-loop, and that was shown by several groups a year or two ago. 
So the second question that, that we, we thought we could ask was, well, which DNA polymerases are actually replicating the DNA when the forks are restarted by homologous recombination? And to do this, we first needed to develop an assay which would allow us to see which polymerases were used. Uh, and, and of course, we could see which polymerases were used in uh, normal DNA replication. And <clears throat> this actually all came about after, after some conversations with uh, Tom Kunkel. And what, what we ended up uh, doing was using a polymerase mutation, uh, in this case in polymerase epsilon, where there's a, a mutation in the steric gate of the polymerase active site, which helps to discriminate between, well, the steric gate is the part that discriminates the DNTPs from the ribonucleotides. Okay. And <clears throat> so you put in um, a, an increased number of ribonucleotides if you have a, a, a slight uh, change in the steric gate. And so any DNA that's made by this particular enzyme <clears throat> in this particular strain of, uh, of yeast will actually incorporate about tenfold more ribonucleotides than uh, a wild-type so, uh, wild polymerase was. So the setup is we have this in our background. We have to delete the RNAs H201. You heard a little bit about um, uh, <coughs> ribonucleotide um, uh, excision repair. If, if, you, if, if you don't delete this, then basically anything that's put in by this mutant polymerase is taken out so quickly we never see it. And so this is our test locus. The, we've got a very strong origin of replication here, and replication forks uh, in pretty much all cells go off in these directions, and therefore one strand will be the leading strand, and the opposite strand will be the leading strand on the other side of the origin, and similarly with the lagging strand. Polymerase epsilon, we've been told, is uh, the, the replicative polymerase for the, um, for the leading strand, so what we should see is a lot of incorporation into the leading strand, and that's indeed what we see. If you look in the leading strand, either side of, <coughs> of here, you probe your, your membrane with probes for, that recognize just one strand of the DNA, and you see that after treatment with alkali, the RNAs are degraded and you get a smear of DNA and you don't get a discrete band, whereas <coughs> if you, uh, and that's true on either side, whereas if you um, probe with the lagging strand probe, you see no evidence of degradation. So this is a physical assay which, as far as I'm concerned, fundamentally tells tells you that Tom Kunkel's right and uh, the other idiot's wrong. So <coughs> the um, system that we want to... So we can do exactly the same thing with the, with the DNA um, uh, delta. We have a, an equivalent mutation and we see the opposite um, <coughs> uh, profile on the, on the two strands. So we can now um, do the experiment in our, uh, at our test at our um, RTS1 locus. It's actually the same origin of replication we were looking at in the, in the test uh, previously. So we have a, a leading strand and a lagging strand. The replication will be normal. And then either we have barrier activity or not. If we don't, this replication will also be normal. And if we do, we'll ask what happens if the barrier has uh, caused the cell to replicate this by homologous restarted replication. And this case, we're looking at polymerase epsilon mutation and asking what happens. So if you look at the, um, <coughs> the region here that uh, you know, shouldn't change, what you see is exactly what you'd expect, which is you get degradation of the leading strand um, in the polymerase epsilon mutant and not degradation of the lagging strand. If the barrier is not active, you don't see any different. Again, degradation of the leading strand. But if the barrier is active, we are slightly surprised to see we get degradation of neither strand. So it looks like polymerase epsilon is not involved. So we can do the same experiment with polymerase delta mutation. So if we use the polymerase delta mutation, then we see that the leading strand, sorry, the lagging strand is now degraded and the leading strand is not degraded. Obviously, if the barrier activity is not on, then this piece of DNA is replicated normally and we see the same thing. But if the barrier activity is, um, <coughs> is on and you restart the homologous combination, what we actually see is that both strands now are degraded. So both strands here are made by polymerase delta. So at least some uh, aspect of the replication machine that's moving through here, even though it's doing conservative, semi-conservative uh, DNA replication, it is not actually uh, a canonical replication machine, and both strands are ultimately synthesized by polymerase delta. So this is pretty much as far as we've got for, for 
convincing data. What we're trying to do now is to ask what other proteins are actually required for this replication event and what other proteins are actually present um, on this piece of DNA because, of course, the whole point of doing it at a single locus is one can do things like CHIP. And ultimately, we would like to you know, follow in the, in the footsteps of Massimo Lopez and Dana and actually look at the DNA structures both during the restart event and after the restart has happened. So those are the sorts of things we're currently trying to do in the laboratory, as well as using a similar mutation in polymerase um, alpha to ask how much polymerase alpha is involved in replicating these strands as well. And exactly on time, I will just go on to the conclusion slide, and thank you for your attention.